told you the greatest story in American military history has never truly been told? What if I told you all the books, all the movies, everything you've seen in history didn't include one of the greatest family stories? And this is a family story that I know well because it's my family. And I only 10 years ago heard this story from my dad who was there. And this is the story of the invisible generals. At the start of World War II, there were 335,000 people enlisted in the United States military and armed forces. And of all those people, there were only two black officers, a father and a son, Benjamin O. Davis Sr., Benjamin O. Davis Jr. They would work with eight different presidential administrations. They would help make America safe. They would create the practices and policies that we all see around us today, but no one's ever heard of them. And their story is only known to true military historians. So today I'm going to encourage you when you hear this, go back home, talk to your parents, talk to your loved ones, talk to your aunt and uncles and ask them, tell me about your story. Tell me about our family. Because I learned this when I sat my dad down and said, dad, what is the story of our family? And he told me, Doug, the story of our family is the story of the invisible generals. And I'm going to start the story off in 1930. In 1930, there was only one black officer in the whole United States, Ben Davis Sr. And there was one black congressman in the United States, Oscar DePriest. Ben Davis Sr., as a single dad raising three children, sold the family house in Washington, D.C., and moved and relocated the entire family to Illinois so they could live in the district to obtain the necessary signature to get his son into West Point. Ben Jr. wanted to be a pilot. And the only way that him and his dad thought he could be able to live that dream because it was illegal for blacks to handle heavy machinery such as airplanes was to have him graduate from West Point Military Academy in the top third of his class so he could be a pilot. So Ben Sr. sells all the family possessions and moves to Chicago so he could live in the district to get the signature of the one officer because you needed an officer signature and the one congressman because you needed a congressman signature to get him into West Point. He hugs his son on the platform of the train station and goes, son, this is your moment to start your journey to become the greatest general in American history. And at 18 years old, Ben Davis Jr. begins the journey and takes a one-way train ride to West Point. When he arrives at West Point, he gets pulled into the Commandant's office and under a sign that says duty, honor, and country, he stands and says, sir, I am ready to serve. And they said to him, we are preparing your room right now. We have a special room for you. And when he leaves that office on the first day of school, he goes into the special room right next to the broom closet, right next to the janitor's closet, a converted room at the end of the hallway. And they tell him, you will be staying here. Without a roommate, without a traditional room, Ben sat in that room and went to bed that night a little bit confused and nervous and scared for his journey as a, the only black cadet at West Point. When he wakes up the next morning, he hears the pitter patter of the feet of his fellow cadets. And he runs down to the sinks where they were all headed for a meeting 
thinking that flyers were placed underneath the doors that he didn't get a hold of. And when he gets to the room, the doors are locked and he listens in and they say, we have accidentally let a Negro into West Point. From this moment on, you are to treat him as if he is invisible. You are not to talk to him, speak to him, acknowledge him in any way, shape or form outside of official duties. And anyone who does that will be dishonorably discharged and permanently banned from the military. Ben hears this and runs back and calls his father and goes, dad, this is what just happened. And his dad said to him, Ben, there are 7 million black Americans depending on you. You must set the date in your mind, be a leader and finish and graduate from West Point. He hung up the phone. He told his dad, it's too bad. None of the 7 million people are here. And he began a journey that ended with him becoming a four-star general. For 50 weeks a year, 52 weeks a year, 50 of the 52 weeks a year, he is sit on West Point's campus, totally isolated from the rest of the students. He had to eat alone. He had to wake up and go to study by himself. He wasn't allowed in the library. He wasn't allowed in study circles. He had to go to campus as completely invisible and silenced. No one called on his hand in class. They left him in the woods for days and weeks at a time. He had to go to the army Navy game on his own bus. He was 100% silenced with the fear that he would drop out. With three years behind him and one year to go, he gets called into the commandant's office and he is told he is currently in the top third of his class, which means that he should be eligible to do whatever he wants to do in the military. So Ben Jr. says, I wanna be a pilot. And they say, there's no use trying to be a pilot because it is illegal for blacks to fly. And it is illegal for blacks to command whites. So it's not possible. So we have an idea for you. Why don't we start a law firm for you and you honorably discharge from the military? And Ben says, no, I want to graduate. One year later, at the graduation in this photo right here, Ben Davis Jr. and his dad, Ben Davis Sr. become the only two black officers in America. Because they didn't want blacks to be in charge of whites at this time, the government and the military put one white soldier in every single black troop in America so neither Ben Jr. or Ben Sr. could command them. The only people that they could command were college students. And at the time, they were all black colleges. Now they're called HBCUs. So Ben Jr. and Ben Sr. for four years in a Jeep went from college to college to college and inspired young black men and said, you can do it. You can be successful. We did it. You can do it and one day your number will be called. And for four years, they went around and touched the lives of thousands and thousands of young men. FDR was looking to get reelected. So he brought in Ben Davis Sr. as an advisor to Negro policies. Once he was advising him, he said, how can I win the black vote? And Ben Davis Sr. said, the best thing for you to do is to show that there's equal opportunity in the United States military for blacks. It was the biggest company in the world at the time. And he said, you need to allow blacks to fly planes. And FDR said, well, I could do that, but who would lead that? And Ben Davis Sr. said, my son. 
And that was when Ben Jr. went down to Tuskegee, Alabama, and was the creator and the commander and the mind around the entire Tuskegee Airmen. 15,000 black Americans and a 100% segregated air force was put together to fly and be a part of World War II. Overseas, after they had gotten the brand new airplanes that they needed to fly, Ben said, we should paint all the tails red so we will be noticed and immediately identified as the red tails. And that night, all of the tails of the planes that they were flying were painted red. And that became the Tuskegee Airmen, the red tails, which is you may have heard of. And they became known as that throughout history. When the war was over, they came back to America. America had won the war. But what had made Ben so upset was that the military media department was started to follow him around to show that blacks were indeed inferior and to get a picture of the planes crashing. But the planes never crashed and they came back successful. When he comes back to America, he gets elevated as does his father. Ben Davis Sr. becomes the first black general in the United States Army. He works with Truman to desegregate the military. And on his retirement, he looks at Ben Jr. and goes, I need you to carry the family torch from here. And Ben Jr. goes on to become a one-star, a two-star, a three-star general. He's the commander of the 13th Air Forces. He's considered one of the best, if not the best pilot in the entire United States military. And on the night before he's supposed to get his fourth star, he's told that by LBJ that he had done enough for civil rights and it was too hot of an environment and he did not feel comfortable elevating him to a four-star general. Ben was devastated. Ben retires in 1970 and takes a job at the Pentagon and works under three different presidential administrations, Carter, Ford, and Nixon. And during that time at the Pentagon, he develops some of the things that we see and use every day around us. The 55 mile an hour speed limit to help save lives, the United States Air Marshal Program to help keep the skies safe, commercial airport security that we go through every time we travel by the planes. All these things were from the mind of Ben Davis and he shows up nowhere in the history books. He wasn't allowed to do interviews. He wasn't allowed to speak. He wasn't allowed to talk. All he did was put his head down and for the country that silenced him and treated him as if he was invisible, he worked until the very end to find presence for it. On the 50th anniversary of his graduation of West Point, he went back to the campus and in the celebration for him, they put up a painting that said America's first Negro general air force. And he said, can you remove that title and just put American general? And they said, you don't want the painting? We'll remove the painting. And he goes, I just want to be looked at as an American. West Point and him go their separate ways, never to be talked about again. And in 1998, President Bill Clinton reaches out to the family and invites us to the White House to elevate Benjamin O. Davis Jr. to the rank of four-star general, retroactively making him America's first four-star general of African-American descent. Four years later, Ben would pass away on the 4th of July, 
2002. And in his final wish, he requested a black tombstone on a hill to overlook all of the white tombstones and death that overlooked him in life. And I heard nothing else about Ben Davis. Years went by and I was learning the story from my dad and I couldn't understand why his story had not been told. So I decided myself to change my career, became a diversity officer to help continue to give a voice to the voiceless. And I went around to the institutions to see how we could help build and symbolize what he had done in a way that was held gravitas and that was a reflection of the excellence that he provided. And in 2017, I went back to the West Point Military Academy and cut the ribbon on the Davis Barracks, the biggest, largest dorm in the history of West Point located in the center of campus. In 2019, we cut the ribbon for the Davis Airfield at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado. In 2021, I'm proud to share with you the United States Mint has the Tuskegee Airmen on the back of their quarters. And personally, I took this as a way to say, what can I do for my generation? And if you remember when Aunt Jemima was removed from all the packaging as well as the food mascots, I was the person who was responsible for that. So I bring this story to your attention to say, sometimes our best foot forward is because we're standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us. We cannot look at history books and movies as the end all be all of some of the greatest stories in American history. So I want everyone here to go home and I want everyone here to look within their own ancestors and their own family and ask, who are your invisible generals? Who are the shoulders you stand on? And who are the people that have allowed you to come here? Because sometimes purpose looking ahead is found by looking in the past. Thank you very much.